Yeah. But I'm glad you got Benny. Yeah, I'm just gonna have her give her regular talk. So if your class needs to drop off, they can drop oh, off. Oh, that's fine. Yeah, I think yeah. that's still there. Okay. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> We're going to start again, and now everyone online can hear us. Hi. So for those of you in the room who heard my introduction before, too bad you're going to hear how wonderful Dr. Brown is. For those of you online, I don't know why I'm looking at the projector. I'm tired. <laughs> um, you will get to hear our introduction for the first time. So thank you again um, for everyone here who has helped organize uh, this so that we can welcome our second speaker to the Hussman Media Justice Speaker Series. Thank you to our own Abide Committee, as well as the Center for Information Technology and Public Life for helping to co-sponsor the event. Thank you also to Mater B. Reddy, Kara Schumann, Bridget Barrett, and Pisa Jang for their help in organizing the event. Thank you to Dr. Deb Procat for hosting us in his class and for all of the students for being patient with us while we figured out the technology. And thank, to, thank you to Dr. Daniel Priest for spearheading this effort. I'm very, very happy to welcome um, my friend and very impressive colleague, Dr. Danielle K. Brown, who is the John and Elizabeth Bates Cowles Professor of Journalism, Diversity and Equality in the Hubbard School of Journalism and Mass Comm at the University of Minnesota. Her award-winning scholarship examines the intersections of representation in the news, underserved and historically excluded communities and movements for social justice. Dr. Brown has published dozens of peer-reviewed studies in this field, in both in journalism, mass communication, and in political science journals. She has recently published a provocative piece in Nature, drawing from her research that demonstrates how news coverage delegitimizes Black Lives Matter protests. In it, she writes, civil rights protesters are the least likely to have their concerns and demands presented substantively. They are given less space to protesters' quotes and more space to official sources. Dr. Brown is also an associate editor for the International Journal of Press and Politics and is on the editorial board for digital journalism and journalism practice. Before we attended grad school together in UT Austin, she was a photojournalist, a designer, and a PR professional. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Daniel K. Brown to share with us. Thank you for your patience. Um, hopefully, I've got this set up the way it's supposed to be. Thank you for inviting me and for having me be part of this lecture. I've given a lot of talks and done a lot of research on Black Lives Matter, on protest coverage, um, and today is really special for me because it's the first time I've ever been able to present. I felt like I had the data and the confidence <laughs> to be able to present on an issue that I was, um, was near and dear to my heart, and that was police violence against Black women. Um, it was a thing that I've been thinking about since 2015 um, when Sandra Bland had died and I was in Texas. So many women had been abused, victims of police violence and police abuse. Um, but trying to figure out where do you get the data from, right? How do you find the data of invisible data? And so um, I kept track of this over the course of um, quite a few years and uh, I'm excited to be able to present this to you today. Um, so my talk is titled For Their Use and To Our Detriment, which is a quote from um, Audrey Lord. I'll talk to you about that in just a second. Uh, Black women, police violence, and intersectional oppression in the media. Where's the camera? There. Okay, trying to say hi. So, um, so the title is pulled from this quote from Audrey Lord, which is, um, she says, for Black women as well as Black men, it is axiomatic that if we do not define ourselves for ourselves, we'll be defined by others for their use and to our detriment. Um, Audrey Lord has been a huge uh, feminist influence in my life and in um, the way that I have understand uh, Black feminism. Uh, she's both here calling um, out the problem of how our representation is, what's happening in our representation, and also saying like self-empowerment is important, right? So she's one of the few, not the few, but she's one of the leading black feminist scholars. It's like your individual power matters. 
And um, I think that's what really sets her apart. She's also not the most famous of all of the black feminist, um, the black feminist spots. And so um, I think that her sort of positioning and individual power has been really powerful for me as I've watched sort of these habitual systems um, continue in our, in our world and, and show up in my work. Um, so I wanted to talk to you a little bit about sort of how I, how I place her context in the context of Black women. But before that, I'm a storyteller. And so I'm going to have to take you back. <laughs> I do this a lot. Sorry. I promise I'll be rather quick, but I go on tangent. So bear with me. Um, so I just take here the shot of not so many opposites. It's American. I live. And it's beautiful. Yeah. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. <laughs> but um, I moved here last year to see Dr. George Place. I was part of the church. And um, I'm not going to lie, one of the hardest kind of hard things that I've had to do, not only because I was in India and all my stuff was in office, I had a homeless because of the tent that I couldn't actually have a place to go. <laughs> um, and I'm moving here as a researcher who's a bit overwhelmed about what I'm about to walk into, right? So it was scary. I've been engaged in these issues. Really going to try to uh, just play more key, basically. How have I been able to let it go? How have I been able to let the representation of both the protest and of the neutrality and the psyche of the let it go? See, of all that, trying to fix it. Um, and so I'm, I'm realizing what I'm walking into is the press for the first time really starts calling me. And for the first time, people are trying to figure out what they do with my research and how they present this right. And it's pretty overwhelming. <laughs> not going to lie. But I'm also coming to a city that is, um, I'm coming to a city of a single mother with two children. And the Star Tribune, which is the, one of the top 10 most speculated newspapers in the country, is um, describing Minneapolis like this. So on May 30th, they say the city is burning every single night. That was hard, right? Hard because I know as a researcher, this is probably an important. But also hard because I know as a black mother, I have to walk into this, <laughs> like on the ground, ground zero, you're not going to be able to escape it. Um, so this is the reality sort of that I come to you with here, right? And why it's so great to be able to bring sort of the story to you here, because it really has shown one sort of the stability of racism in our society, but also sort of how this evolved in my own research and my own thinking about what the solutions are. Um, so, the city actually burned down. <laughs> it did not burn down. Yes, things burned, uh, but not all things burned down. Um, and I did not rebuild this for you here, so I could prove that we've also reckoned and then rebuilt the city. <laughs> um, so this, um, I leave with this anecdote because one, it was my real life, and two, that example of what the Star Tribune did in that particular article is very. Uh, in, in the coverage of Black protests. Um, so I have worked within the framework of the protest paradigm, which basically, you know, sort of a nutshell, of if I put my life's work into two sentences or so, <laughs> um, it says that the, the news media delegitimizes protests that push against the status quo, loosely defined, right? Before that was kind of like war protests, and now it's more like race uh, protests about race and colonialization. Um, and really, this uh, theory is kind of established in 1980s or so. Um, it hasn't changed over time. Even with technology sort of interventions, if you're the mainstream news, um, it's been sustained and has been sustained in protests that challenge the So, in my research, I started first looking at um, the protest of Ferguson, where the protest paradigm played out. And then I looked, uh, I went backwards a little bit to the protest that followed uh, the death of Trayvon Martin, Martin and protest paradigm played out. And it continued to play out as I did my dissertation. And those things, 2014, 2015, 2016, in that document. And, you know, I was pretty pleased that I can support theory to some degree. Pleased as in an academic, <laughs> not pleased as in the reality of it, right? It was stressing though. Because there's tons of articles that are coming out there like protest paradigm, which is relevant anymore. It's not relevant anymore because the protest paradigm is no longer applying to some of the things that used to challenge the status quo. So, for example, the women's march. The protest paradigm is sort of eradicated here, right? You know a lot about what happened to the women's march protesters. You know a lot about their substance, why they were there, what they needed, what they were demanding, what their biggest grievances were. Um, the same thing with immigration protests, actually. You know a lot 
about what the the separation between separation of families protests were on the protests of the border. Um, but that wasn't the case with um, protests of Black civil rights issues. And later, I found uh, when I started comparing protests to try to make a point. Um, um, so these sort of sit towards still supporting this protest paradigm theory, and everything else kind of doesn't, which is distressing, especially as scholars in my field begin to throw out the theory. I'm like, wait a second, <laughs> bring it back, right? So the hierarchy here in the United States, it, well, there is a hierarchy. I'm sure there's one in other countries as well. And the hierarchy here in the United States is very racialized. Um, and really wants the, the status quo, if you're pushing at the status quo here, the system that most that is most uh, intimately protected by the media is going to be this racist thing. Yeah, I look at the coverage of these individual cases to sort of make this claim um, in the in the research that I published. You'll see uh, that like for Trayvon Martin, there wasn't a lot of violence in those protests that followed his death. But there was just calls to nonviolence instead, you know, um, referencing preachers or community leaders that would call for calm to insinuate that there could be violence. Um, and then that sort of changed, shifted a little bit in, um, in Ferguson after the death, shooting death of Michael Brown, where there's tons of episodic coverage. And despite the ratio of violence to peaceful protests, there is a ton more coverage, about 33% of coverage is, is dedicated to talking about the destruction of these protests and much less is dedicated to talking about the substance of why people would give up their days, go out in the street, give up their sleep, go out at night, and scream outside of police departments and police buildings. So that was in 2014. I kept looking at these cases over time. Um, and the next one that stands out to me is Stefan Park in 2018, which was the one that I thought, as I had many times before, thought, this is the one. This is going to make a difference. Right. This is this is going to be the case that makes a difference. So I was shot in his grandmother's backyard, cell phone in hand, at her back. I thought this is this is it. It was not. This was not the one that made a huge difference. I saw I saw a little bit of protest or a little bit of coverage that I analyzed. It fizzled out as it usually does. That coverage um, spent a significant amount of time framing um, Clark as deviant. Um, leaving the police anonymous, and then again focusing on the disruption and anger of the protests, um, and their their annoying um, habit of canceling NBA games, uh, and not enough on what this what the what the problem was. To illustrate this point in this particular case. He uh, Stephon Clark was killed just like a week before or a week after um, the the Parkland shooting, and the the idea of gun violence was not connected in these two cases, not once. The coverage from Sacramento Bee or the major metropolitan newspapers in California or the national media. So, if there's a hierarchy of things, right, of protests, of social movements that take place in, in sort of the media being um, supportive of them and showing their substance and worth, uh, science and health end up at the top, environment protests end up at the top. And then at the bottom, we really see this anti-Black racism, anti-Indigenous racism protest that would be routinely delegitimized in the press. This article that this comes from is called A Hierarchy of Social Struggle, which is what we call this particular idea. And in the discussion section, the first time I got to say, like this small little paragraph, you know, there's a thing that didn't show up, though, right, at all. <laughs> and that would be protests and social movements um, in support of Black women, in support of intersectional issues that would cross over some of these major power systems. And that's really what I want to talk to you about today. These uh, particular protests are not just pushed to the margins and delegitimized. They literally don't exist in the coverage for a really, really long time. And again, I'm a storyteller, so I'm sorry, into another anecdote. I promise I'll come back out alive. So will you? Um, so I will transition over to talking about police violence against Black women. In that, in that, as knowing it's going to probably fall into that lower section of the, the hierarchy one in terms of visibility and two in terms of how that coverage looks whenever it does actually exist. That's where the, the sort of meat of the story starts today. 
Um, so I want to take you back to our previous home. student, I was working on a project that took me right now every other weekend to Jasper, Texas to record pieces of a documentary of people who um, live there. So I was in Waco and I had to go all the way down with different professors on a regular basis, lots of fun, and he asked me to in an hour. Um, and so uh, I, we worked there um, on a project that was principally set to think about how leadership had changed in that city. Jasper was important. Because James Ward Jr. had been dragged there in 1998. And that made national news. You know, a lot of parachutes come in to the town, try to wait for the child to over, figure out what was happening. And it really, really upended the town, right? The industry moved out. The racism and racist tensions or race, racial tensions between communities were not eradicated, they were actually um, heightened. Uh, and you know the, um, the the town ends up in economic despair. People don't want to be there anymore. And it's called like the jewel of the forest of Texas. And so you know it was a huge um, devastation to the people that are there. They they started moving out. And they have to find it. So I was there um, looking at or talking to these people about what this impact was. Uh, what the impact was on their lives what it felt like um, to still remain in the town, what it felt like to keep the town. And, um, and again, I just spent a really long time there. That's, just, that's the whole story. I don't have much else to add to that. Until I fast forward to 2015, and I'm going to it. <laughs> it's gonna connect, to give me a second. Um, I'm standing there in um, Dr. Asika Tinsley's um, Theory two class. I had decided I would just hop on over to the afternoon after diaspora studies because I really wanted to take a class that had lots of really cool books. She taught me all kinds of things about invisibility, like because because um, slate or our histories were not recorded or were erased in such a way. The Afro-imaginative, for example, was a way to fulfill sort of those those um, non-existent archives, and it really broadened my life and opened my eyes to all the things I didn't know. But in one of the books that she had on the syllabus, this book by Beth Ritchie, and it was a broad book. It was, it was one of the few social science books that was there. And it's talking about you know, the violence against Black women, the lack of visibility to the violence because of all the intersectional spaces in which we are delegitimized because of her sexuality, because of her gender, and because of her race. And that lack of visibility was entirely unfamiliar to me personally, but um, but I still was shocked when I got about halfway through the book. And Dr. Ritchie talks about this Risa Adele Arnold. Um, it was my it was my wake up call. She talks about a woman who um, was um, dragged behind a car in 2011 when I was there in Jasper, Texas, in Orange, Texas, which was just a hop, skip, and a jump away, literally. A hot skip in the jump away. I hadn't heard about it at all. I hadn't heard about it in the media. I hadn't heard about it from these, from these Texas towns. You can imagine everyone rides on a horse there, right? Um, but the small Texas towns, right? These are very small Texas towns. They know each other. They're not completely segregated. Somebody has been dragged. I'm studying dragging, and nobody's told us anything about this. It's like mind blowing to me this many years later that I'm finding out from the, from the footnotes of a book. Um, and I couldn't let that go because I'm one of those people I just can't like, let these things go. So before I show you what the little minimal coverage of her death looks like, to sort of start to illustrate the problem of what visibility looks like for us, um, I just want to remind you these and all of the women that we're going to talk about today are someone's daughters, right? They are they're they're loved at some point in their lives, and so it's it's uh, pretty devastating to know how they were described and their final. Um, moments on earth. I want to pull into, um, really there's only about 10 articles about her max. Um, and this one from the talk radio, um, I'm gonna pull into a quote that you'll see that was used habitually to describe her and what um, her intentions were. Um, the Shira, your husband, um, and our going for acquaintances allegedly got together to possibly do 
sex and have sex as Sam did. For they are two sex. And then allegedly struck her with a hammer and then dragged her behind the car. It wasn't the only time that this happened when the Dallas Morning News covered it. It's decided that that particular quote was very good to include to Right? Almost every single article got her included from the sheriff of the town. Uh, this is, uh, he's, he gets life in so and he's disturbed. So what's this giving evidence of the thing that I didn't know about while I was in the space, I was in this wheelhouse, right? It was so upsetting to me that I couldn't see it, even being there. Right? And news audiences experience this all the time. So that's where she has brought this to my attention during my PhD program. And again, I can't let that go. Other headlines used to describe her death, the death of a woman. So again, if someone's daughter the face like this. And the protests that followed her death from her family were not much involved. So let's fast forward to Sandra Blam. First sort of real case where I'm like, ah, oh, look, we're seeing something. This is good. We're seeing someone who has been, um, you know, a victim of police violence under circumstances that are complicated, right? Because she's not dying from police violence. It's, you know, um, according to the autopsy report, she's just been uh, violently attacked before she dies um, by suicide. And so, um, her case is like the first chance I get to look at hypervisibility of, of a black woman or what I thought was hypervisibility. Um, in in um, uh, her coverage, she got about 40,000 news articles in the first week of her death, which is pretty dang amazing. Well, she pulled uh, some of the other cases that you may know, maybe to Jerry Becton, who was uh, referred to as the sneak Negro, got about 50 articles in the first week. And so, um, you know, 40,000 news articles, this is not just from the mainstream news, this is from other news um, providers. Um, and that, that was huge. First time we had a lot of visibility. Um, and mostly that coverage is uh, really looking at the forensics. They're totally trying to figure out what happened to her and her death and convince people who have questions, right, about her death, to convince people that um, the forensics are right, that she has um, died by suicide in her jail cell. And all of the information about the other police officer is, doesn't appear as much, right? Um, and the, the, the altercation, which is why I'll just show you sort of what one of her final sort of looks looked like before she was taken out of the car. Um, you know, this, this part of this man wasn't really covered until we found out that the police officer committed perjury. Instead, it was focusing on um, her mental health, right, and her um, and the problems with conspiracy theories of people who have been by suicide. That same week, also devastating to me that I didn't know that um, a young sixteen-year-old girl um, died of suicide in her jail cell, and my dad was the first to know about her her entire cycle. Let's move up to 2020. When Brianna Taylor um, is uh, shot by several police officers and killed in her apartment. This was really the first time a co trained quantitative researcher in love with critical theory. <laughs> this is the first time I have the opportunity to find data at a level that makes sense. Like I can systematically look at this, I can pull it out, I have the framework. It is time, it is our time to look at this press coverage. And I was excited in like the geeky way, not the not the devastating way, because again, Brianna Taylor's death, if you read about it, is devastating. Um, and I don't want to dehumanize her by um, by being excited about data. That's that's certainly not the case here. Brianna Taylor's coverage, she got about ninety thousand articles overall um, in twenty twenty. Um, and Sandra Bland, just for comparison, overall in 2015, the year she was, uh, she died at 12,000. So this is like huge data, um, pretty exciting, a uh, significant breakthrough that there are this many articles written. But 
What if I told you George Floyd's articles got more than one million? Got more than one million articles in 2020. And hear those cases and think about how long Breonna Taylor's case resonates with the general public versus George Floyd's. Not that they need to be compared, right? But just that to make the point that this coverage is different um, and it's substantially different. And we haven't talked about that enough. So um, Larry Gross, who's really thankful Nikki Usher pointed me to his book, um, but he and it talks about visibility issues. And he says, um, uh, towards the end of the book, he said, visibility like truth is rarely pure and never simple. And that is most definitely the case here. Um, I just want to take you to some key sort of uh, things that you can pull out from Brianna Taylor's coverage that I pulled out when I looked at the coverage from the Courier Journal, which is the local paper there in Louisville, Kentucky, um, and the one that circulated in the state. So in the coverage of Brianna Taylor, uh, we talk about 10% talk about Glover, who is her, um, her ex-boyfriend uh, that was in prison, right? Uh, about a third of that is talking about Walker, who is her boyfriend that was um, involved in um, in her apartment, she was um, shot and killed. And then we only have about 3% of those, that, those articles talking about that blank incident report. Remember the reason why we didn't know anything about Breonna Taylor in March <laughs> is because that blank incident report was filed. And we didn't talk about that enough. I mean, we as in the Career Journal did not talk about that enough if it only appears in 3% of the coverage. When it comes to the protests that followed, um, the paradigm isn't totally unraveled it's for pretty much the uh, sorry, one of those boxes that moved at the is about 68% of um, the coverage talked about the protest. Most of it is focusing on uh, uh, violence writing, so this is the most prominent delegitimizing frame that showed up a lot, about 17%. Tons of attention to celebrity activism, so when people talk about the commodification of, um, of uh, activism in the space, this is sort of one of the reasons why, right? There's a ton of talk about what Oprah did. There's a ton of talk about what Beyonce did. There's a ton of talk about what the NBA did. And there's not a ton of talk about that blanket incident report. There's also uh, quite a bit of information about <coughs> confrontations between police officers. Now, these protests were intense in Kentucky, and you might not know about them because they didn't cover them enough, and I'll show you that in a second. But we had police officers that got shot. We had police officers shot protesters. We had days and days and days of protesters. We had police officers that used drones to hurt protesters. It was intense. That nuance doesn't really exist in its full effect here. Um, but what I can tell you about the, the Courier Journal that I applaud and love, this is the first time I can say this is a news organization that knew they screwed up on day one in March. And then they I give them props for staying and covering a story that has never been covered. They stayed, they stuck with the story, they continued to report on the story update, and they try <laughs> to give a narrative that is more effective and efficient. And this is really the first time I've seen ratios that are kind of similar, like maybe about half of this coverage of protests is, um, or I'm sorry, just the ratio of one to one is talking about um, the, the, some of the substance of the protest, right? So it's mentioning George Floyd, but it's more <coughs> the negative measure, like what happens to black men also happens to black women. I bet it's not made in depth. I'll tell you, analyze the coverage myself, but it is made, like that connection is made, and that's unusual. Um, same thing is talking about racial injustice. <coughs> it's talking about racial racism about 12% of the time. This is the first time justification is a huge problem, a, a huge reason why the warrant was put out in the first place. This is the first time justification I've seen um, justification come up in coverage on a regular basis. This is only 18 articles, but 18 more than I saw in many other cases where justification was a problem. Um, and then we have this creeping up narrative of police violence and police abuse about protesters. That's not nearly as high as you would think it should be, but at least it exists. And again, that part was invisible for a really, really long time until 2020. We see that sort of show up in um, Minneapolis as well. And I put this because I thought it was really interesting. If you put, you take away the Courier Journal and you put, put it to place our legacy paper, the New York Times. On June 4th, they, they wrote this article, posted this article that says, why aren't we talking about Breonna Taylor? That'd be June 4th, that'd be like almost four months after she's actually been killed. And I just wanted to 
illustrates it, but the Courier Journal published 860 articles about Brianna Taylor. The New York Times published 127 articles about Brianna Taylor. If you look at them on the scale, and I just want to point towards you, <laughs> you know who really wasn't talking about Brianna Taylor? It wasn't the Courier Journal, it was the New York Times. The New York Times was talking about Brianna Taylor. But it's why aren't we talking about Brianna Taylor? Because they were. Now you realize two persons is actually here, and it gives it because lots of people weren't talking about Brianna Taylor until they were. But this awakening with the Courier Journal is something that I think is important to not only apply but like make, make sense of because that doesn't work with the paradigm that Black women face in these scenarios on a regular basis. So that was 2020. All this stuff is happening, and I know what you're thinking. But we reckon, right? <laughs> Um, and so I wanted to talk a little bit about like what, what changed with this reckoning that we've talked about so much lots of times in lots of different places for journalism specifically. You know, that the capital, um, the, the beat in black was finally capitalized, which was a hallelujah for many people. We know that there was distinct language changes. People started thinking about things like tear gas protests. We know that there was the creation of lots of DEI management positions and initiatives. We know that there was lots of public apologies from some newspapers that were like, maybe we should audit ourselves and see if we're bad, right? <laughs> and then there are new recruitment and retention efforts that are being placed inside newsrooms uh, to try to get, create sustainable environments for black and brown um, journalists who are now striking and walking, off their, walking out of their newsrooms for that negative coverage. And we also know there's, uh, you know, creeping in right around the, the trials, there's new protocol for what do we do with these deaf and dying images that are so um, damaging to certain people. You know, they revolutionize, they can create revolutions of sorts, but they also hurt, right? These images can injure. So we know that there are some things that have changed. But in my data, I've sort of like pushed through a couple of studies I've been thinking about that or a, a collecting data on through my, um, my survey of, of journalists, uh, counting at 68 now from July through October, uh, when I asked them what the most pressing issue of journalism is today, only three of them said it was diversity in the newsroom. When I asked what the greatest challenges of writing, pu writing and publishing stories about the center race, racism, and the racist system are a lot of it are the same things I've heard before. We have to persuade our editors. We, there's not an interest in it. Like this is old news. Um, getting the audiences um, who need, the, we can't get the people who need to read it to actually read it, right? And um, they're worried about the fragility of people, right? If we write about this, people will get upset. In April 20th, 2021, um, Chauvin was convicted and that was a really good day. Um, and I just, again, will say this city looks a lot prettier that day, like a lot prettier that day. But the very next day gave journalism the opportunity to show your work. What has your reckoning done, right? And that reckoning came with the coverage of the Kai Brand, which wasn't much, to be honest. It was just one of the most damning narratives for Bryant, um, and again, problem with visibility, is that uh, they got this, they got things wrong. And so um, Bryant is 16 years old. The mayor refers to Bryant as a young woman on Twitter. News organizations repeat his words verbatim, and now a little girl, a child, becomes a young woman very quickly. And you only get, I think the saying is something like that, one chance to make a good first impression. Thing like that. Um, and it shows in terms of how audiences react to that. But also, New York Times loves to tell us why are we talking about things. How many times did they cover a kind of brand? Yeah. But it's, I think, they hate here, but these are actually the same. There's a unique URL because they published in the two. Seven times published online about her. I'm a bit of a pessimist, not gonna lie, but I feel like I have the data to back it. Uh, if you come over to Minneapolis, who also disappointed me, the Star Tribune, um, they had a test 
uh, right, right after that as well, um, Winston Smith Jr. was um, surrounded by police officers and shot um, in his car, and they erroneously described him as a murder suspect um, before they retracted the next day. And they did retract the next day, and they did apologize the next day. But again, that first impression thing is incredibly complicated and hard to change. Which is sort of the last data point I just want to give you here. What what do audiences, did the audiences reckon? Like, can they see past this crap? Please be able to see past this. I did a couple of different surveys, one in Kentucky, one in Minnesota, and one that sort of tried to reach out to a more nationally representative sample of that. But I can tell you is that, um, not really. We saw the Pew data to say, look, people are more supportive of Black Lives Matter in the beginning of 2020 in May. And then we saw that regress. And the same thing is what I see in my data that I, um, I last surveyed uh, at one year after the protest. And um, what I came up, some of the big takeaways here are that uh, the demands are really central to, the demands of protests are really, really central to what people remember. Most people remember that these are about Black men. Most people remember that these are about racial justice. We cannot thank the media for that. I mean, but we can, <laughs> right? That's the most um, that's the most current memory that people have when I ask them, "What do you remember about this?" and ask them to write up. Um, we know that maybe the obvious thing is that people are supportive of a Black Lives Matter protest or racial injustice protest, more Fox News conservative ideologies. That surprises no one. But what is really, really unfortunate is those people, especially in Kentucky and Minnesota, that are disrupted by these protests, they are less likely to support this protest no matter what their ideology is. They didn't want to be disrupted, which is counterintuitive because that's the point of protest. We need to disrupt the status quo so that we can make sure you see something that you have not seen, you as a metaphorical politician or powerful or even just your neighbor, right? Like, care about what I care about. That's what protests do. They're supposed to be disruptive. And the very act of protesting then, as you may have seen several times, this also may not be a surprise, but in, in the NBA and the NFL, um, even the protests we saw in the first of it just really shows sort of an intolerance building for, for protest and protest behavior, no matter what it is. And then again, one of the more devastating findings from this particular um, set of surveys, especially as I look into Minnesota, which is just up for vote on this question too, in Minneapolis and Hennepin County, it's just now up for vote. What are we gonna do with these police officers? This police, um, these, uh, sorry, this police department. They want to change it to the public safety. But there's uh, not enough public information about what the demands are what that actually means. And there's a huge gap in knowledge in terms of what the reformation of police would look like. Many people still think it's defund. There is very little thing, or very, very few white Minnesotans that will support any kind of radical change in policing, um, no, matter, no matter what. One of the biggest predictors is being of a different race. That's it, which is alarming in many ways, especially as this vote comes up. So I borrowed um, this terminology again, as I was a PhD student, still discussing the same thing. Uh, and she talks about the dynamic stability of patriarchy um, and how, you know, we, we progress and then we regress, but if you like look at the meat, look straight across, it's all the same. And I think that this is totally, um, I think it's accurate when you think about the coverage of black women and that sort of, oh, we had this, you know, we have this moment of visibility and it turns back to invisibility. The hypervisibility is complicated and actually not that great, but people maybe know people's names, they get the issue. Um, but patriarchy and racism are these running systems that are helping each other sustain each other, right? That dynamic stability is being aided by both patriarchy and, and racism. And it hasn't changed. <coughs> so we're still going to be talking about the same stuff. It's you know, something different. Um, and I actually have suggested the same damn things over and over and over again. <laughs> actually, <laughs> uh, I have to give you some of those things that I have suggested over time. 
I have said over and over and over again, change the norms and routines, and I fear that I have not been specific enough, right? <laughs> like maybe we should be a little bit more in depth. So I'm going to give you that today. I think one of the things we have to do is reconsider the officiality of our sourcing. We have to know what um, we have to reconsider who elites are and why we privilege them and how we privilege them. We have to center equitable, justice-driven efforts, storytelling narratives. This is not solution driven. There's not a solution to racism. There's not one solution to any of this. There's lots of solutions to all of this, right? And so we have to think about justice driven narratives to move forward in a way that will align with those narratives. We also have to quit trying to break everything, as in news and spirits. Um, <laughs> You know, breaking news is something that lots of people do on Facebook now, on Twitter now, and I think that, you know, this um, obsession of trying to be first is um, unhealthy, right? It's how narratives get spit fired out quickly without a lot of thought. We need to hire more um, reporters of color, also not an original thought, right? <laughs> and support them, not an original thought. And uh, one of my favorite ones that people are like, huh, how is this related? We have to offer them a cancel button. Readers, a cancel button. Let them have access to the news. Pay for the news for a month and be able to cancel without sitting on the phone. These are the opportunity to limit or have access when they want it and not make it complicated to unwind that access. I know for me, one of the things that I won't I won't subscribe to something because I'm like, oh my God, I have 700 subscriptions. This is exciting, right? How do I, un how do I, how do I stop that? Um, I just quit subscribing to things, right? <laughs> I mean, that's the, that's the core solution. Um, but we make it really hard in the news, news industry, especially at the, at the local, um, smaller local and um, metropolitan areas, just sort of cancel. It's really, really hard to cancel. So I think giving people access to news and then them being able to actually read the things that they put out that are smart is really important part of this puzzle. And then three additional things that I think that we have to think about that I probably haven't pushed forward loudly enough in the past is when people were really uncomfortable in 2020 and I felt it because they actually came to me for advice, right? <laughs> it was, um, I, it took me aback, right? Um, and it was hard both to be in that position, but also to try to manage, like, what, what do I do on the fly in the space to be able to help news organizations thrive and activists in many ways? Um, how do we help them thrive and push out a narrative and make these connections between these entities? Because these are powerful political actors too. How do we give them their elite status? Um, so I think one of the things we have to do is stay uncomfortable, right? If you, we have to stay on top of this critique. We have to be able to crank out data. Um, quickly, which I do most of my stuff by hand, which is not quick, <laughs> <laughs> opposite of quick. And so a big call for big data people to work with smaller data people um, to really try to um, figure out how we can do these audits quickly and successfully um, and robustly, right? Because some of these things aren't easy to find. Um, and then the other thing I would say for journalists especially is to get out of the pack. A lot of times some of the same narratives fell up. They just Keep the same narrative over and over and over again. So if you look at after the 1619 project was launched, how many other 1619 projects showed up afterwards? Um, it's really interesting how these unique, could be super unique narratives sort of take on each other um, and are in competition with each other. And I just figured there's enough stories out there. We don't have to compete against each other. Um, and then the last one is, of course, find a business model because capitalism is driving half of this or more all. Maybe, uh, <laughs> but you know, especially with mainstream news, this the point is for things to sell, and I and I get it. I I understand we have to make money. But there's other ways to make money that don't um, do harm to other people, right? Um, and I think nonprofit journalism is one of the spaces that has figured out how to do that successfully and still attain retain some autonomy from its funders. Um, and then I want to go back just a little bit to talk about again, the title of this um, talk um, and think a little bit about not just what journalists can do, what can Black journalists do, what can Black people do, what can Black storytellers do, or Black students, what do they, what do they do with all of this? Because it's pretty heavy and devastating and doesn't look like, I mean, when I talk about dynamic stability, I'm saying like nothing's changed, no matter how many times people have been up here. 
Um, and I think um, our li limited visibility, um, we have to re recognize that our limited visibility can be used against us, especially in the mainstream press. We have to acknowledge that that probably won't change. But there are some examples that happen. Um, but as Stuart Hall says, um, at one point, he says, what replaces invisibility is some kind of carefully segregated visibility, right? And I think that that segregated visibility is kind of what we, is modeled in the coverage of Black women uh, who are killed by police. Um, and I, what I love about what Audre Lorde is saying um, here is that she's saying, no, you know, we need to define ourselves for ourselves. So this is really a call, my call, <laughs> for, um, you know, people of color from people in marginalized communities to embrace alternative journalism spaces um, and to recognize their worth. It's also a call for people who do not identify with those marginalized um, communities to embrace the work that they're capable of producing and that they will produce um, in spaces that allow them to produce that. I wanna show you a few of these projects that, are, that exist within the mainstream. One is this project that came out of the uh, Philadelphia Empire, the uh, Call Our Wild Exchange, which is a team of journalists here um, that are really working to bring out the stories in the communities in the mainstream um, and to highlight um, what the community looks like, right? And what their dreams look like. We talk a lot about Black Joy. Um, they try to position it here um, in, its, in its realist form. Um, also, uh, when I was in Minneapolis, I met up with a team of um, uh, reporters from USA Today. And all that team of reporters from USA Today, USA Today for on the ground. So this was not a parachute attempt at telling storytelling. This was an invested effort from a major news organization for them to come in and spend time with that community and bring out nuanced narratives. This um, documentary that was, uh, that was a part of that project was on the ground. And I love it because it actually highlights one of the few activists that is still on the ground today every single day, right? Um, her name is Marcia. It's fantastic. Um, but she, uh, it really highlights her story and her work and what she's done in George Floyd Square for months and months and months. Um, and so, you know, the, those kind of efforts are new and new to this space, especially for national news organizations. And then, of course, um, the GOAT, right? You think about the 1619 Project and what it did and what it, uh, what it reimagined in the space of the New York Times um, and the spirit of being able to really position not only our history. Now, place them together. Our resource uh, invested effort from a news organization. I do this, I can talk about the New York Times for some things, but this particular project, excellent. We need more opportunities like this to do that. We need them in the mainstream. We need to find them in um, alternative spaces in our drone efforts. Um, they're essential to be able to define ourselves for ourselves, and they cannot be used for a Dutch family. But that is the end of my talk, and I'm happy to answer. Is there a question? I don't know. That's what I do you want to? <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Uh, so in the coverage of Breonna Taylor that you looked at um, was mostly from uh, the, the Courier Journal, right there. Only looked at the coverage. Yeah, yeah. But I'm curious, like in looking at maybe similar patterns. Um, well, they're not going to be similar as we've learned. But like, to what extent the narrative um, in the site of violence and the home plate, you know, the hometown of the victim, you know, how that, how their framing plays a role. Does it play a role? And if so, how in how national stories are framed? Like if that's the first place to report on it deeply, as even though they didn't for a couple months, then they started to. Like how does that framing, you know, like when you looked at Ferguson as well, I know you looked at like, you know, the local coverage and national coverage, like what's that relationship like and how important is that first, um, the first attempt, right, at like setting the impression and how are they describing that? Yeah, so I haven't, 
over the course of time looking at this local coverage, haven't found a lot of differences between local and national coverage. Brianna Taylor's coverage is, and the coverage of the protests that followed is really different, though, because the Courier Journal is very um, forthright with their sort of. First of all, they're su they're suing the police officer for it, or the police department for um, not releasing records, right? They're not opening the records up, and they're suing on a regular basis, and they're asking, like, can you please get out of our lane? Like, we need to do this right now, and you can't all sue at the same time, or it's going to take too much time, right? So they're asking people to get out of their lane. They're really upset because the national media is misreporting some of the things that they've already corrected. So they've corrected some of the things that happened in this police report, and then the national media gets some information that is not updated because they're not reading the local coverage, and it comes out, and they have to do this all over again. So I know that like there's tensions, right? Especially in a smaller town like Louisville, um, which is not tiny, but it's not huge. Uh, but there's some tensions between what that relationship is, especially knowing that many, most times, these people leave, right? And they their relationship with sources, with the national media especially, um, they can make or break a relationship altogether. People will not trust all journalists because one journalist screwed it up, right? And so um, I think that, you know, I think that one, it's a personnel thing, right? But two, because the norms and routines, unfortunately, are so similar, that the narratives end up being similar. It's just that some of the missteps along the way are, are, are very clear, especially in that particular case. Um, I've never seen anything so messed up <laughs> in terms of backtracking on a narrative that they tried very hard to, to fix. Um, the, yeah, this case is just very different in terms of what they had available to them to, to report for a really long time. Yeah. Yep. I really enjoyed your talk. What would you like the media to do in the future uh, when you deal with this police violence uh, and this whole thing that now going on? in terms of the racial record. Sorry, but I, I miss, what do I want the media to do? What would you like the media to do differently as we are in the midst of this racial reckoning? Yeah, so I want the media to do a couple of things. One, to research, research is the issue in advance. This is gonna happen again, right? We haven't changed anything. <laughs> so research this issue in advance, start to build not like a, not beyond cultural competency, some kind of knowledge, one of the issue of race and racism and power systems and patriarchy, but also how that looks in their communities, right? It's harder at the national level to imagine what their community is, but then again, it's totally not because there's like, lots of people from the New York Times write about Chicago, live in Chicago, right? Know about your community and be prepared with a network of sources that are not your typical go-tos. I think that that is the biggest, that will be the biggest change um, in coverage and the narratives that come out of it. If, if they can identify educated sources, not only sources, but educated sources that are able to give um, a robust perspective and a unique narrative, right? One of the uh, people who, who, when I talk to activists, uh, one of the people who really want to be quoted are preachers. But like I said, in the coverage of Trayvon and, and beyond, right? Uh, it's not just Trayvon Marcus, this happened. A lot of times, ministers and preachers and reverends, especially in the Black community, are used to call for cause. Uh, but they are also activists. Like the AME Church is built on activism. It's, it's a very different kind of um, Protestant church um, history and building. And there's lots of activists there. They're incredibly educated. But, but journalists are hesitant, right, to talk to spiritual and faith leaders as reputable spaces, which is kind of mind blowing in our current political landscape. So I think that, you know, really getting rid of some of the biases, biases that we hold of not being able to talk to certain people and not, you know, nonprofits are going to give us a PR spend. Well, so is your governor. Right? <laughs> uh, you know, allowing them the opportunity to not have to fight, speak, I think is really important. I worked in um, a health nonprofit advocacy for a while before I worked in the higher education nonprofit um, as a PR representative. And you know, one of the things I found most frustrating was how hard it was to get a journalist to take care of my story. Like, first listen, that was hard enough, right? <laughs> but then, will you take care of it? Will you, will you, will you give, will you give the narrative the justice and passion that I had behind it? 
And the answer was like, not really. <laughs> we don't really have the time and space to do all that, you know? And so um, I think that, that taking the time to realize like um, the PR side of things, even though I think often referred to that side as the dark side because that's what Charles referred to me as. <laughs> But the PR side of things is not here to not follow any ethical rules. It is not, it's not devoid of morale. It has it. I mean, people do things because they're passionate about it. I mean, they just like to get a job. PR doesn't pay that much for the drones, does it? So um, I think that, you know, having respect for that relationship and, and, and allowing those people that are in those spaces who are meant to be persuasive, but also have valid information and are taken seriously and are given um, space. And, and time and uh, I have one big question. Okay. Um, can mainstream news organizations be trusted to reconstruct their often biased approaches to covering stories around race and social justice? If not, how will they change? Can they be trusted? Okay, can mainstream news organizations be trusted to reshape their coverage? Uh, their, yes, to reconstruct their biased approaches to covering stories around race and social justice. Yeah, I think there's two answers to that. Um, thanks for the question. I think there's two answers to that. The first one is, yeah, I mean, we can do a lot of things to change the norms of the team. Think, <laughs> you know, um, hopefully some of those changing the sourcing narratives, um, thinking about what headlines go first, thinking about what pictures are used on a regular basis, thinking about patterns, right? When um, even thinking about stories and packages, like I can't just write one story and write three stories, and one will have this perspective and this narrative, and one will be like, you know. Um, a little bit more in depth in terms of the community impact, and then one will really focus on the societal impact. I think, like, you know, rethinking how stories are packaged would help with these overall patterns that I talk about all the time. But I also think that, you know, you can work within a system, but then you, there's the only other way to fix it is you just walk away from the system um, and you blow up the system or it's something like that. And I don't think the systems don't blow up here very often, ever. <laughs> Um, so I think that walking away from the system is, I think it is time to give alternative activists and um, uh, non-mainstream journalism, for lack of a better identifier, their time and space and their, their athletes to do emergency too, because they do say, like, we can't work within the system that mainstream journalism has created anymore and to fulfill this role. So we're going to work in this system. Now, we see the bad side of that, too. We start like, looking over to some of the things that we see online. Um, but I think that fundamentally, when you look at sort of the literature um, on activists and alternative media, that, that that's what that core is. It's saying, like, we can, this system isn't going to change, right? Um, and because it's not going to change, where can we add to that narrative? Um, earlier on, what, I just want to say thank you. This has been such an incredible presentation. But early on, you mentioned the delegitimizing framework of protest and how they're covered. I was wondering, one quote that I saw on there was the lack of impact that technology and its evolution has on its coverage. So as we move towards these decentralized networks as a potential you know, counter to those biases, have you looked at any like algorithmic uh, data into how we can maybe deconstruct certain platforms and ways in which they might be funneled or that information might be in some ways inhibited. Yeah, so I have I have looked a little bit at sharing and engagement patterns, not necessarily at algorithms and software patterns. It's fascinating to know see if there would be ways that they would be willing to tweak those algorithms so that certain narratives could come bubble up to the top um, and other narratives could be. I think over time when I looked at audience engagement patterns, um, what we find a lot of the times is that some of the um, coverage that has the, that debate frame, the legitimizing coverage, actually gets shared pretty well with most protests. <laughs> Not always with race and racism, but definitely with most protests. Um, but I think that, you know, if you look at some of the most viral coverage, which is predicated by a lot of different things coming into play, but that coverage tends to um, dehumanize the people who are at the core of the protest, when it comes to black protests, tend to be really locked in, uh, locked into uh, narratives um, that, in some way, incorporate violence, whether it's through the, the through the protests that transpire, or talking extensively about the violence to that particular black person's body, 
um, that skill. So uh, when I think about like Stefan Clark, we already did this very in intimate analysis of the most viral coverage, the autopsy report was talked about so often, but like, I mean, again, these grueling de details of it, and this was the most shared testimony, right? Grueling details of injury and, um, and death, uh, they talked about his, his bones shattering in his body. Um, there was a protest that was run over by police, um, and she, her being run over by police was among the most shared, again, physical injury to a woman by police, officer in a car, <laughs> right? Um, and so I think, I think there is, um, it would be great if there was sort of a de-escalation violence, um, but I don't know exactly how how that would how that would how good how much good that would do. It's kind of I think the a similar conversation that that has gone on about what do you do with these images, right? When you see these videos, do we play these videos? Is it worth what? Is it worth what the outcome is? And I think. I think it's really a double-edged sword there. You want people to be aware because clearly you haven't gotten it yet, right? But also, if things don't change, we need to quit hurting people with the same thing. So I think that I think I would do the same thing with the other. Um, just out of curiosity, um, when you were analyzing the data about how journalists covered um these cases I'm, I'm curious whether they were referencing the national political context um specifically want to think about the presidential race which was going on in 2020 um, <laughs> because one thing that i've been thinking about as you were presenting but also in terms of some other work that sort of shows that like whites might be motivated to tune into racial protests when it's a proxy for a larger partisan fight, let's say anti-Trump, and then that sort of might fall off once 2021 happens, and then the larger patterns that you saw, like decrease in support, more conservative ideologies. And I'm just curious whether, in terms of your analysis that newspaper coverage, whether you saw journalists indexing a lot of these cases to larger national level politics and the presidential campaign. Yeah, I don't think so. Not, not not very often, but mostly because the coverage kind of died before the election. I mean, right before the election. So, I mean, Brianna Taylor's coverage was once the AG decided he wasn't going to charge these police officers or charge one with one on the, um, the coverage stopped. I mean, for the most part. Um, he did some follow ups with family and how they felt. There was some protests. I mean, that, it, it pretty much stopped, and that was in August. Um, and I think you know the the political influence in Minneapolis was very much anything Trump said about these protesters is going to be included, and that's where most of the political coverage was. I mean, I think that the association is there because of the amount of coverage Trump got for talking, um, for speaking as he did, and then and then. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. Oh, Dan. Oh, Dan uh, maybe you get the last question, Dan. Okay. Go for it, please. Yeah. Is there any research into the media, pro media problem or is it like a American culture problem or is it a combination of both? Because I feel like even like even tomorrow, imagine if you said the protests are good, we've got to fight for racial justice, people would simply react as we've seen and start going just really far right and start trying to overthrow the capital and do all this weird stuff because they just can't they just can't handle it it's like baked in no matter what information you tell them so i guess what do you think about that i mean, that's... I, mean I think it's both i it's routinely get devastated i'm like really are we still there <laughs> you know um as a society but yeah i think i think it's both i think there is a relentless protection of our power system um and unwinding them means literally people who have or have to give it up and they have to be uncomfortable. And I think that it's the same thing in journalism that is in society, right? You have power, you're not using it appropriately, we're asking you to give it up. That is almost impossible to get to. And to stay. Right? I can maybe can get you to give up your power permanently. If you get you to give up your power permanently, it's never happened. Uh, 
So I think it's I think it's both, and I wish I had something to do. It did happen. They they overthrew their clothes. They overthrew their slave masters, and then we punished them for the next hundred and twenty years. So yeah, I mean, it's possible. It's just and it, <laughs> the outcome is not always great. Thank you so much for coming. This is wonderful.